In this lecture, we'll increase the complexity of derivatives in our scope. So far, we have concentrated a lot on pricing of European options. Now we will move to a little bit more complicated derivatives. This time we speak, we will talk about uh, pricing of forward start options. Today's lecture will concentrate on a few blocks. First, I will introduce what are the forward start options and what is the uh, payoff definition. How to think about it, why would you trade it, and what is the advantage compared to standard European type of payoff. Uh, once we uh, talk about forward start options, those options are not as simple as normal or classical European type options, where you see only one, where you have only one maturity. Here, uh, to, to solve the prices, except maybe for the simplest models like Black Shoals, uh, you need to have a little bit more involved uh, pricing technique. For that reason, we will concentrate again on characteristic functions. However, we cannot just apply characteristic functions as we have seen it in the previous lectures. We also need to look at the extension. We need to look at the forward start characteristic function. So you see we have a forward start options. This means we also need to investigate what are the forward start characteristic function. And what happens is that this characteristic function is more involved than uh, what we have seen so far. We have to solve some additional uh, expectations. Um, Two types of uh, forward start options will be discussed in this lecture. So one is about Black-Scholes model, from Black-Scholes model, for which we can actually have characteristic function, also pricing we can do analytically. And something which is the more interesting and more challenging is the pricing of the forward start options under the Heston model. Uh, we will also, I will show you also the implementation in Python. And uh, we will move a little bit further from the Heston model, so we'll increase the complexity of the Heston model, and we will introduce jumps. And Heston model with jumps, this is so-called the bytes model. So the model with a Heston, exactly the same dynamics, however, with additional Merton jumps, as we have seen already in the in previous lectures. And finally, once we know the forward start options, so the ones we have defined here, we know the characteristic functions, we can move to pricing of a product which depends on volatilities. And this is the ultimate goal of today's, uh, today's lecture. This course, we have dedicated a lot of time to European type options and the relation to pricing of exotic options. So as you may remember, uh, European options is a very important building blo block once we talk about the calibration and pricing and the usage for exotic options. So typically in the market, we don't see often uh, quotes for exotic derivatives. Thus, they are not able, we are not able to calibrate models to the exotic derivatives. Therefore, using the arbitrage free principles, models are typically calibrated to European type of payoffs and then uh, the same set of parameters, which is determined from the calibration to European payoffs, are used to kind of extrapolate uh, the parameters for pricing of uh, exotics. This makes sense also in the sense that uh, if we price exotic derivative, we would hedge it, and hedging typically would take place uh, based on uh, simple derivatives like European calls and puts. Therefore, we need to make sure that model is well calibrated to the hedging instruments. If your hedging parameters will not be correct and sensitivities also will not be correct this means that you'll be completely mispricing not only hedging but also the exotic derivative of, of interest so that's kind of important relation but of course one can ask uh, is there is uh, is there something in between between ex exotic derivatives that we don't know anything about and european type of options and there is a link there is a type of options that we are going to discuss today uh, those are the forward start options so forward start options, it's a kind of a European type option. However, we don't uh, start, the option does not start today, but it will start in the future. So those options are also called performance options. This means, uh, imagine a scenario that you say, uh, I would like to invest in a stock. I'm not so much interested in the level of a stock, but I would like to uh, bet or I would like to buy an option on the performance. So I would like to have an option on the uh, uh, grow of, of the stock in a given period of time and this period of time can be also in the future so that's the the main principle um, so i just mentioned the forward start options are called the performance options so this is uh, uh, if you this is equivalent essentially so uh, 
that will be also clear later once we define uh, mathematically the payoff function. Um, the payoff, the option, does not depend on the value of a stock. So once we talk about performance, we don't really care about uh, stock level. We talk only about uh, the difference between values in the future uh, and uh, some other time in the a, in a, in a, in a future also, right? So forward start, this means the performance is over the future period of time. Um, so forward start options are considered European type options, but they have future starting date. So in, um, in previously in the lectures, we always considered today to be T0 and we have maturity time T. Uh, here we will have an extension of that. We will have a T1 and T2. And those two dates are bigger than T0. This means that you cannot, that initial value of a stock that you would use, for example, for pricing of an option, uh, would not be constant anymore because we don't know it today. We know we will know it at time t1, but it's unknown at time t0. So this is this is what it also states here. Uh, whereas in European options, initial stock value as zero is known at the initial time. In the case of the forward start options, the initial stock value is unknown and it will be determined at time t1. So this is also related to the concept of filtration. Filtration tells you about uh, how much knowledge do you have. So if, for example, if you have a filtration F T1 and you have, for example, expectation, this is an example, S T1 and your filtration F T1, this filtration contains also information about a stock at time T1. This will be measurable. So this means in not, we know because the filtration contains this information. So this is equal to S T1 because that's equivalent. Uh, so this is something to keep in mind. If you are um, not so much familiar with filtrations, I recommend to uh, refresh that knowledge because essentially here, and uh, once we also talk about the tower property or iterated expectations, the relation between different filtrations and uh, which inflation, uh, which filtration is bigger or smaller, that's very, very important. Um, so also what I have just mentioned, um, forward start option does not depend on today's value of underlying stock, but it is uh, on the performance over a certain period of time. Yes, so another element, so uh, we have exotic derivatives in the market. We also have European type options and forward start options are often considered to be building blocks for other derivatives. So imagine um, you, here I, we described the options like PLICAS or so-called RASHET options, uh, which can be constructed out of uh, forward start options. Imagine a scenario where um, you, as an investor, you don't want to, if you have a contract, let's say for 20 years, you don't want to uh, put your money, whether your stock at the end will be bigger or smaller than certain strike, you like to, let's say, lock in your profits. So imagine a scenario where we have a time, we have, uh, this is time T0, this is T1, T2, T3, T4, and so on. And at every point in time, so over, let's say, every year, we would like to see how our stock behaves. And depending on the performance of the stock, we would like to log the profits. So for example, we, we are in here, and then we look at this period of uh, time T1 and T2, and we say, if the stock performed compared to the initial point at time T1, if it performed uh, very well, we would like to lock in the profits. If it didn't perform very well, we don't want to pay any losses. So what we can say, we say, for example, we, don't, we always would like to have a, at least, let's say, 3% of a coupon, so if the performance is lower than 3%, we always get 3%. And if in order to not to make this option too expensive, the maximum value is seven. So this is kind of a, a, also a strategy to reduce the cost of derivative. So if we have a, a call option and we say, if the strike is 100, but if, if the strike reaches 200, then we don't get anything extra, that's typically an effect that we can consider that will decrease the value of an option and that will be cheaper for investor. So in this case, uh, everything in between, this is our profit. If the um, performance will exceed 7%, we have 7%. And if we lower than 3%, we still get 3%. So how to define it mathematically? We would have something like a maximum. And we have here, of course, 
S T2 minus S T1 divided by S T1. So this is a measure of performance. We have to multiply by 100, so we have 100%. And here we always say it's a maximum, so we put here 3%. So whatever value of the performance will be higher than 3%, this is our gain. And we cannot get uh, lower than 3%. And there is also upper bound. We would say the minimum of this and 7%. So you see, in this construction, we constructed kind of a, an element for clique option so that for every interval, we would perform exactly the same uh, coupons. So that then we would have a summation over all periods in time. And as you can see that here, it is a, a kind of very desired structure because uh, at every period, we don't really care about uh, how, perf how stock performed, what is the value of a stock. We only look at the performance. So we don't care whether it's 100, whether it's 200 or 300, we get a percentage performance uh, of the certain notion. So this value still will be some kind of notional of amount that we agree with counterparty to be paid to us. So this is very desired and many investors like those kind of derivatives. However, in order to price it, we need to know something about uh, how to price those type of uh, uh, forward start options, the performance options. And this is the description of the clique options where the profits can be limited and the contract can be specified uh, in a way that we can have a a sequence of performances and that's our derivative that we wish to price. Uh, if we go further, so if we just mm, define this payoff, so this is ingredient, this is exactly what we had here. So here we had a maximum, um, then we had a performance and 3%. We can also define it in the in the following way. So we have a performance minus strike. So that would be a, a call option on a given strike. And we see that there is a forward start element because we have a T1 and T2. So it's a, if we have time T0 here, we have T1 here and we have T2. We look at this performance in the future. So obviously this should not depend, this performance should not depend on S at time T0. Um, if we have a, a variance, so if we choose T1 equal to T0, then we end up with a European type of representation. You can see that we can scaling effect and then we have a ST2, so it's a payment at time T2, with adjusted strike, and the strike is given in this form. So you see there is a relation between European calls and forward start options. And of course, if T0 goes to T1, those two options will also converge. Of course, you will need to make some adjustments to uh, some scaling parameters, like here S0, and also strike will be slightly different. But this is the, the general idea. Okay. Um, we can also redefine uh, slightly the payoff. So you see that here we have a ST2 minus ST1 divided by ST1. Obviously, we can just separate this so it will be ST2 divided by ST1 minus 1 minus strike. So this could be reformulated in this way. And then once we talk about pricing, we do, obviously we need to calculate expectation. So it's an expectation under the risk control measure of the future payoff discounted to today. Keep in mind that here, this is also important, what you discount from. So if we have a time grid, again, we have a time T0, we have T1, we have T2. The, we look at the performance and the payment will take place only at this moment, right? So always, once you talk about pricing, always take a look, a really special attention, where is the payment date? Because that payment date would define what kind of discount factor you have to take to discount it. So here we pay at time T2, the performance. So we discount from uh, T0. So it's basically this value is brought here with this one over MT2 and this quantity is equal to one. And of course this strike here, this uh, it's a different strike. It's not just K, it is K plus one. So this strike is the, uh, let's say, adjusted strike such that we just deal with a ratio of two stocks, stocks in at time uh, ST2 divided by stock uh, at the time T1. Uh, what we can also do, we can reformulate it even further. We can say um, our um, ratio of two stocks is equal to exponent of X T1 T2. And that simply would be just a logarithm of a ratio of two stocks, right? So you can really see that an exponent 
uh, will uh, cancel with the logarithm. So we end up with a logarithm here. It's a, it's a x is essentially log of st2 um, t1, and it's the difference of two stocks. And note, until now, we haven't done any assumptions regarding the stock dynamics. So this is important. Uh, the, um, the assumptions and particular choices of model that will be an element of the next part. But at this point, we haven't those, let's say, derivations and discussions are generic to any model that we would like to uh, to consider. Of course, here we do some something with uh, an exponent logarithm. This is under the assumption that the stock process we will consider here is not going to be negative, and that's a, a reasonable assumption to consider. There are multiple ways to price for starting options. One could consider Monte Carlo simulation. One, for example, could also do a PD approach, an analytical solution, for example, with a Black Scholes model, which is also possible, or something more generic, which will also allow to all the models in a defined class of processes. Uh, to do that, we need to find forward characteristic function. So once we have a model uh, which has a affine form, for which maybe we don't know the exact distribution, but we know the characteristic function, then the application of a characteristic function, a Fourier a transformation, as we have done it in the previous lectures, would allow us to price forward starting options once the characteristic function is known. So let's take a look at the price of a forward start option once we have determined the characteristic function. So as we see here, so this is the, the generic solution that we have already we have obtained for the maximum xt. This is the logarithm of a ratio of two stocks. So if we go to the in this slide, so we are interested in an expectation. So by definition of the characteristic function, we have an, an expectation of an IU log st2 minus log st1. So this is the just the definition of the characteristic function. And here we have filtration ft0. Now what we can do, we know that uh, we can use the property of the tower property of expectation. So this is what happens here. You see inside we have a, we condition the expression. Uh, so inside we have a second expectation, conditional expectation, and the conditioning takes place on a bigger sigma field. Uh, why it is bigger? Because this is the, tells you, this ft1 tells you about the history until time t1. So obviously there is much more history uh, at time t1 as we would have in time t0 because we have a t1 is bigger than t0 so obviously this is bigger sigma this is bigger sigma field so we can do uh, we can apply tower property for expectation and then this is equivalent with this expression here okay so once we do this so once we do the conditioning at uh, filtration ft1 some quantities are known so uh, is ST2 known? No, it is not known. It will be known at uh, time T2. However, uh, ST1 is known because we assume here, we consider a case where we have filtration at time T1. This means that we are at the moment in the future. So obviously stock T1, ST1 will be known at time T1, right? So this means that this expectate, the exponent of the minus log ST1 can be taken outside of this expectation. So this term, here we can take it outside of this expectation. And this is what we do here. Um, of course, keep in mind that we cannot take it outside here because the filtration here, it is ft0, right? So uh, it is not, uh, uh, it, it is still stochastic from perspective of time t0, but it's not stochastic if we look from perspective of time t1. Okay, so st1 is measurable. This is how we say if something is now at a given time, it is considered, it is named measurable with respect to the filtration ft1. Then this is what we have. So we, we take this exponent minus iu log st1, take it outside this uh, inner expectation, and this is what we have here. Now, what we can also do is that um, in the derivations for the characteristic function, we always dealt with a discounted characteristic function. So what we can do, we can just uh, add and multiply. So we see we multiply with exponent Min uh, r t2 minus t1 and then we have a minus r t2 t1 so it's basically it is cancelling out however the inner expectation now represents the discounted characteristic function uh, from t2 to t1 so you see that there's a discounting play place from the future point t2 uh, up to moment t1 so this is uh, uh, 
uh, in future we can think is as the we can consider this as a future expectation that's called forward currency function so um, everything is known only at time t and the remaining part here it is this part is constant we can take it obviously outside the expectation uh, in general, once we talk about a discounted characteristic function and not discounted characteristic function, it doesn't really matter so much, especially here since we consider uh, um, deterministic interest rates. So then we can always take the, the discount factor, take it outside the expectation. There is no difference between them, between discounted currency function and non-discounted one. And once we have stochastic interest rates, however, this is not covered in this course, and then in, there is a big difference, and then you cannot simply take things outside the expectation. The reason, of course, there is that if we have interest rate, which is stochastic, uh, we would like to have it correlated with a stock. So then uh, the product, let's say, of a discount factor and a stock, they're not independent anymore. So we cannot really separate. But in this case, this is just for um, um, to be consistent with our previous definitions of the discounted characteristic function. Therefore, we can write it as follows. So for characteristic function for x, and x here is x t1 to t2. So this is this distribution we are interested in. It's an expectation on the risk neutral measure. And then we have a minus i uh, u uh, x t1. Of course, x t1 is uh, simply, it's a logarithm of uh, s t1. Then we have a, a part which corresponds to the discounting with the interest rate. And then we have a function psi x, and then we have a u t1 t2. So you see, we are here considering the forward starting characteristic function. However, the expression inner expectation, so the psi x, it is simply characteristic function, but with different um, sigma view. This is what we see here. The inner expression, this is just a definition of the characteristic function. So what this means is that uh, once we derive the characteristic function for a certain process, and we are looking for forward starting characteristic function, essentially this means that we have to plug in that characteristic function and then compute additional expected value. And this is something that, uh, uh, this is actually a crucial element of this uh, forward starting currency function. First, we derive the standard currency function or discounted currency function, and then we have to calculate one more expectation, this outer expectation to get the characteristic function, the, the forward starting currency function. It's maybe a little bit confusing, but this comes from the fact that we have uh, two expectations. The first expectation here, it is just a characteristic function, discounted currency function, and the outer expectation corresponds to the forward starting characteristic function. Okay, um, so it, this is formulation is rather generic. This means that whether we find the characteristic function for Psi, so it's whether it's a Black Scholes model or it's a Heston, we can sim simply substitute for a function Psi. And then we have our forward starting characteristic function for any model we want to have. Of course, the same conditions as we had before for affinity, everything holds. So everything relies that we know the characteristic function, preferably analytically. And this is also very important. We still need to solve this outer expectation. So if we cannot solve this outer expectation, then we don't really have benefits of speed. So hopefully the processes that you'll be considering in pricing of the forward circuit function, they allow you to get this outer expectation also analytic. Uh, otherwise, uh, you may uh, see some uh, problems with, with, time, with respect to timing, because maybe you are not able even to calculate the scarcity function. But for Heston model and for Black Scholes model, this is not really uh, problematic. Uh, now we will actually uh, we will test, we will consider those two models in the follow up uh, section. Yes. So for the uh, for the Black Scholes model, we know the currency function. So this is already given in a previous slide, in the previous lectures. So currency function for Black Scholes, it is uh, psi u t1 t2. So essentially, we have to substitute only uh, t1 t2, which is delta t, it is defined here, and then we have uh, uh, x t1. So you see. This currency function will depend also on not on the in, it depends on nickel, but its initial is stochastic because it's not known on time t0. So this is x t1. This is very important. Now, once we have this psi, we have to plug into the expectation, this outer expectation to get our forward characteristic function. Once we do that, we end up with the following expression. So here we have uh, uh, 
uh, you see that we have here uh, i u x t1 and if we go back to our slides we see actually we have a minus u x t1 so this obviously will cancel out so we don't have this dependence anymore on x and then you can see that this basically is gone and then we end up only with expression which will depend on uh, there is no, no stochasticity here so everything is deterministic and so this means that if you would like to solve, we would like to get characteristic function, forward characteristic function for Black Scholes model, it doesn't really depend on x0. This is kind of important. And actually, for uh, it could be also very surprising why characteristic function does not, does not depend on x0. And the reason for that is that once we talk about the forward starting characteristic function, or we talk about the performance options, uh, pricing should not depend on the stock value. It should only depend on the performance over time. So this is this is the reason why we don't see anywhere X, XT0 or ST0, it's not present. So uh, at the end, happened that solution, it's much much nicer what we had in the, in the original discounted currency function. Uh, however, always keep in mind that there is some elements that could be done. Uh, here, of course, uh, also worth to note is that once we consider models with uh, uh, multiple dimensions, so we have an x, y, v, etc. Then we only can cancel x, right? So if you go back, we see that this discounting effect, so minus i u x t1, it is only once. So if we have a process here involving multiple random variables, multiple processes like Heston model, for example, then x would cancel, but the variance part would be still there. So then we still have to solve this inner expectation. But for one dimensional case, like for Black Scholes, it, the forward starting currency function is actually simpler than the discounted currency function because it does not involve the stochastic part. So this uh, x part is simply gone. So then this is everything is constant, can be taken outside the expectation. And this is the expression for the forward start currency function. In order to better illustrate the missing dependence or the initial stock value, let us take a look at the exact representation for the Black Scholes model. Uh, as you may expect for Black Scholes case, so once we consider Black Scholes model, uh, many pricing uh, approaches that are given analytically. So uh, Black Scholes is so simple model that uh, because it's just a log normal distribution for the geometric brown emotion, which is used for calculation of uh, option prices, then it's expected that for many derivatives, we can ex we can uh, derive the pricing analytically. And this is also the case for the uh, forward start options. So let us take a look at uh, uh, the ratio of two stocks. So we have a stock at time ST2 and ST1. As you remember from the definition of a forward start option, we essentially had a maximum payoff was maximum ST2 divided by s t1 so this is t2 t1 minus k0 so at the end we are interested if you calculate this expectation of this type of payoff we are interested in distribution of the ratio and this is the once you know the distribution we can find this expectation and hopefully this is given analytically so um, if we look at this ratio you see that this is uh, it also does not depend on the initial stock value where it comes from is that if we just use the definition of the geometric brown emotion, so for S T2, we have a S0 times exponent, and we have all those elements from geometric brown emotion, and then we have a ST1. Uh, also, uh, you see the difference is only by the brown emotion different times. We have the same volatility coefficient, and uh, uh, everything is almost the same except for the times T1 and T2. Obviously, this will cancel out. So in the ratio, so once we talk about performance, performance indeed does not depend on the initial value, stock value as T0. And this is also confirms what we have seen, al seen already before in terms of characteristic function for the forward start uh, distribution. So forward characteristic function. Okay, um, let's take a look further. So um, because we have essentially model which is... Uh, the distribution which resembles log normality so you can actually see because we have a ratio of two exponents uh, essentially we still have an exponent here because it's just a ratio and then if we collect all the terms we see it just looks like it is geometric brown emotion um, with a brown emotion actually the increment here it is from uh, t1 
uh, up to T2. So this is something different than what we have seen before. But this obviously comes from the fact that we look at the stock evaluation from ST1 to ST2. So obviously we are interested in the Brownian motion from T1 to T2. And then we have uh, coefficients corresponding to interest rates. And then we have a uh, correction, the risk neutrality correction, uh, or the, uh, actually this, this is correction from the log transformation. And then we have uh, uh, times T2 minus T1. So you see this is still geometric Brownian motion uh, with some adjusted coefficients, right? So we don't have any more uh, payment only time T2. We have something which is T2 minus T1, and then this coefficient is also different. So if we look at uh, uh, the pricing, uh, and the proof for this theorem of the, uh, for the pricing for forward start options under the Black Scholes model is given explicitly in the book. Here I will just show you the results, but the result is not a big surprise because since we are dealing with geometric brown emotion, so ratio of two stocks at different times is the geometric brown emotion under the uh, Black Scholes model, uh, then uh, the solution the pricing solution for call option or put option for forward start options uh, resembles the one that we would have for pricing of European pulse and puts. However, there are some slight differences and those differences come from the difference of a strike. So strike has to be adjusted. And of course we have uh, uh, in some places we need to take a look at the, at the times, right? So the, the, the times that is used for discounting. So we discount from uh, T2, so it's T2 until time t0 and then those co coefficients here it's a t2 minus t1 and then we have to make sure that we have proper uh, strikes everywhere uh, but uh, you see also another element here we have a t1 here we have t2 here so this is something to uh, keep in mind uh, just don't apply directly black scholes equation and just try to figure that out which parameters to use is first it's important to take a look at the proof and see where exactly where it comes from which coefficients have to be adjusted so this is uh, important uh, the last element of this block is the implied volatility uh, i already mentioned multiple times that once we talk about the option pricing and implied volatilities we always talk about black scholes implied volatilities this means that although you have maybe used a model like heston to generate prices but once we talk about implied volatility from prices, even from the Heston model, we always use Black-Scholes equation, and this is a uh, this is this is a market practice, market standard. So if you have a prices, you always put them to the Black-Scholes formula, and then you find out what is the implied Black-Scholes volatility. Otherwise, there will be a lot of misunderstandings if multiple people in the market would use different models, and all of them they will be using they will be using different uh, models and different price parameters, then it will be very inconsistent who means which model once he talks about implied volatility. So then we always use Black-Scholes equation and Black-Scholes formula for implied volatilities. Um, if we talk about forward implied volatilities, this is also the case. So since we have derived uh, Black-Scholes equation for option pricing, so we say we have a Black-Scholes formula for forward option pricing, uh, forward starting options, then we can also calculate here what is sigma such that the pricing from the forward start options, it will be much exactly the market. So we are, then the sigma will be forward implied volatility. And so this is the same as we have already done for the standard European type options where they start today and we have payment, we have a payment in the future for the forward start options is exactly the same however then you have two parameters yeah? so we have to keep in mind you always have t1 and t2 and then we have a sigma implied volatility and then it's forward implied volatility so this is a big difference so if somebody tells you about uh, pricing of a forward start option and gives you implied volatility keep in mind that this is very likely it is forward implied volatility this means that you have to use the black scholes equation from the previous slide and then actually you can get the price back. Um, yes, so implied volatility is always corresponds always in the context of black shelves. So this is super important. And uh, I have seen many people uh, make this mistake when they talk about uh, model with uh, jobs, and then they try to figure out what does it mean implied volatility for that model. And it's always black shelves. So this is super important and please keep that in mind. of forward start options under the dynamics of the Black-Scholes model 
it is not really exciting process of pricing, especially since for Black Scholes model, we know the prices analytically. Now let's increase the complexity and let's consider the Heston model. So uh, again, as before, the generic characteristic function, forward characteristic function for the forward start option will have the following form. So we have a, an exponent minus i u x t1. Then we have a pro part for the interest rates. And then we have a characteristic function for process x. So here we see that there is a u and we have those two arguments t1 and t2. So this is characteristic function from, one, uh, from time t1 until time t2. So normally, if we would not consider forward start options, this would be just t0 and this would be t2. Okay, um, now we have a Heston model. So of course, we, what we do here, we increase the dimensionality by one. So we are not considering stochastic single stochastic differential equation, but now we have uh, two stochastic processes. Uh, for the currency function in a, in a Heston model, we have a vector u which you see it is a vector consisting of two uh, entries, two directions. And, uh, first is basically, it is log of uh, x t, right? And the second is our variance, v t. So uh, you may wonder why it is zero here and why it is u here. Uh, in essence, uh, once we are talking about pricing, we are interested only in the marginal distribution uh, for the stock process or for the logarithm of a stock process. This means we are not so much interested in uh, getting density for the variance at a given time. Uh, and this is typically the case. So if we have a derivative or option that depends on the stock, of course, it will also depend on the variance, but the payoff is only expressed in terms of a stock. Then we don't need the second direction, second dimension here. We need only a single dimension for the log of x t. Uh, otherwise, we will need to have a two-dimensional Fourier transformation to keep. So please keep that in mind. Okay. So for the Heston model, our function psi x is a u t1 t2, and we have already derived in the previous lectures that we have some time-dependent function, or is actually a function dependent on tau a a bar. We have a b bar times x t1. This b u tau it is actually equivalent is i u for Heston model. And then we have a function uh, c bar u tau. So those are complex values functions, a, b, and c bars are complex value functions. For b, the solution is, uh, is straightforward, it's just i u. So you can look it up in the previous slides, it is just i u. And this is why I'm mentioning it here, it is um, the following reason, because if we substitute function psi here, we will see that here we have uh, essentially this term with a b uh, bx t1, it is e i u x from t1. So if we substitute, you will see we will cancel. It will cancel out with this term here. So it will be minus i u x t1 plus i u x t1. This will cancel out. So again, as in Black Scholes case, this dependence on x will be gone. But however, it, this part is not gone, right? So we have a, a will say this will be part will be gone will cancel of this part and still we have a c bar vt1 so we have this still expectation that we have to calculate of a c bar function or actually of vt1 function and this is what we have to do next so um, after simplification after substitution of function of characteristic function psi into the forward characteristic function this is expression that we get so we have some um, uh, exponent here a plus r t2 minus t2 so a it is not stochastic it doesn't have any uh, anything special inside it's just a function which depends on uh, it's a complex value function which depends on model parameters for Heston model and uh, tau and tau it is uh, uh, it, it's a vector it, it's actually time distance from t1 to t2 um, for details regarding function a and c I recommend to uh, revisit the slides for the Heston model because there those functions were given explicitly if you are interested in particular derivations how to get those a and b's we have to solve uh, ricati type of odes ordinary differential equations and in the book we provided all the details for that so uh, i highly recommend to revisit that uh, and actually in the affine diffusion models the procedure of calculating those functions will be very much similar to what is done for the Heston model so if we go back here to this uh, forward currency function, 
And this is something that we should not worry about because it's outside the expectation. So it's not explicitly. Here, we, what we have, we have one more thing to calculate. We have an expected value under measure Q, and then we have an exponent of a C. This is the, uh, this other function for the Heston uh, OD. And then we have uh, times the variance at time Ti. And we have filtration T0. So this is this outer expectation for calculation of the forward casting function because the inner expectation is already calculated. This is the outer one. So we still have to perform this computation. So, and this is, unfortunately, it is not trivial. Uh, also in the book, we provided details how to um, derive this expectation because it will depend on a moment generating function as mentioned, as it is written here. It's a representation of moment generating function of VT. Uh, and in a book, I would say, I would recommend actually to look into that proof because it's a, a one of the nicest proofs and very elegant ones how to arrive at the moment generating function and how to apply to calculate this expectation. So um, I will just give here the theorem and for the proof I refer to the book. So if you have a process, CIR process, so it's a variance process for the Heston model, we have a mean reversion, long term mean, we have a process here, vol-vol coefficient, and then we have a Brownian motion, and also we have initial coefficient. Then the moment generating function on Laplace transformation is given of the following form. So luckily what we see it is that uh, the moment generating function or this ex expected value of an exponent uvt, it is given in closed form. And that's very good because if this expectation would not be given in closed form, would depend on some integrations or uh, stochastic integration, that would be very much complicated because this would mean that for every u, so for every argument in the Fourier space, we will need to perform some additional computation and that would make it very, very slow. So that would be not very beneficial. But here we see that this expression in, in closed form, uh, we recognize some coefficients like a C bar, delta, kappa, bar. This, these are the functions we already have seen in the uh, definition of the Heston model once we talk about uh, characteristic function. And this is um, just an expression of all those coefficients. Um, again, something to keep in mind that this is filtration T0. So here we also have a dependence of uh, V0. Okay. So um, now if we substitute, because essentially we still have to substitute this expectation. Uh, so we have this moment generating function as given here. Uh, we have to use this uh, function in, and we have to substitute to the forward currency function of the Heston model. And this is what we do here. So we have this uh, uh, deterministic part in front, and then we have this expectation. And after the substitution, so now instead of u, we have a C bar. And after substituting everywhere C bar, uh, we have a close form for the forward characteristic function. Uh, now, of course, since we know it explicitly, the forward characteristic function, we would like to check what is the implied volatility? How we can use the cost method, for example, of Fourier transformation to calculate the prices for forward uh, options, forward starting options, and what is the impact of the model parameters uh, on the implied volatilities? And keep in mind now, if I talk about implied volatilities for the forward start options, we talk about uh, uh, forward implied volatilities from the Balak Scholes model. So, what we will do, we will compute the prices and then uh, calculate Black-Scholes forward implied volatilities, and we will measure the impact of the parameters. But this will happen in the next book. Now is the time for a numerical experiment. In this experiment, we will consider the Heston model and a problem of pricing forward start options. Uh, for the pricing process, we will use the forward start characteristic function that we have derived in previous block, and we use also the cost method that will be used for uh, evaluation in Fourier transformation. Uh, in the experiment, we will consider the following set of parameters. Interest rates to zero. So it is actually irrelevant parameter for our experiment because we consider only constant interest rates. So that doesn't really matter for the impact of the implant volatilities. We have a speed of mean reversion uh, 0 0.6. We have a long-term average volatility or, or long-term variance of 0 0.1. We have a gamma vol vol 0.2, negative correlation of 50%, and initial volatility or initial variance of 
Sometimes I'm replacing variance and volatility because in a Heston model, we have a square root of VT times the Brownian motion for X process, and we have a dynamics for a variance process. So when we talk about stochastic volatility, we always talk about the square root of the variance, while in a Heston model, we have a process for the variance, which is given DVT. Uh, sometimes I'm just mentioning it as a parameters for uh, volatility or for variance, but you know that it always corresponds to the variance process. So whenever I, we have a, a, a square root, like, it's like here, for example, we have a volatility initial variance of 5%, then if we talk about initial volatility, we will need to calculate the square root of it. And the same for the long term mean. So this is uh, uh, V bar is 10%. So uh, volatility is a square root of it, which is around 30%. In the experiment, we consider two cases. So we will change uh, because effect of implied volatilities on the parameters we already observed in the Heston case. So we would expect that the uh, parameters will have very similar impact as we have seen for pricing of European options. However, in the pricing forward start options, we have an additional uh, degree of freedom. It's about uh, time distance in forward start options. This is why in this experiment, in the first experiment, we have a, a time grid T1 from one, two, three, four years. And then T2, we will have two years away. So it's a one, three, two, four, three, five, and four, six. So we basically would choose a fixed interval of time and we see how this would impact the implied volatility shape. So in this first experiment, um, because so we can see that we have a blue line is the first case. So we have a one, three. So distance between T1 and T2 is always two, and we just move in time uh, T1. So we see that it's actually implied volatility. It's of the same shape in this experiment. So we have a strike here. We have implied volatility in percent, and we have the same shape, but only level changes. And actually we can conclude, actually we can see it already from these parameters. So we see that the variance, initial variance if, is of 0 0.05, and the long-term variance is, has a level of 0 0.1. This means that as long we are moving away from T0, so from uh, T0, so it's zero time, further away in time, then we would expect that the volatility should converge to the square root of the long-term variance, which is around 30%. And this is what you can see is actually everything goes and slowly converges. In the numerical experiment, we will change this parameter. So we'll make sure that VT0 and V bar are the same. And then I would expect that the, the shape and level stays roughly the same. In the second experiment, uh, we did something different. So we have a one fixed point and we expand the length of the interval of the performance. So you could consider a case where you say, I'm interested in performance over one year. I'm considered performance over two years, three years and so on. So this is the case. So we, in the first case, we had fixed interval length and we moved it in time. And now we have a fixed initial point and we just expand, we make it longer. And this is the second experiment. So here, this is experiment for that. So we, if we have a, a T1, one and T2, two, so it's one year distance between the two, we see the volatility is much picked. And longer the distance, it becomes a wide, smoother, you have a distribution, which is uh, uh, the implied volatility becomes flatter, essentially, right? So it's very much picked once we talk about the short maturities. And uh, the distance between T1 and T2, but if it's if it's uh, longer the distance, the volatility you can see there is some skew, but it's not anymore. It is some smile going into skew level. It kind of flattens out. Uh, what is the 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 logic behind? You could expect that if you have a shorter maturity, so the there is a lot of concentration of the density around T1, T2, and longer the distance basically means there's more time for the performance, the performance distribution of performance is wider in time. Again, square root sigma, square root of volatility that we have. Okay, let's take a look at the code and let's perform some additional experiments. So in the code we have, uh, so this is uh, uh, again, as we had in the uh, described uh, slides, so we have uh, two cases, we have a uh, T maturity one and T maturity two. So again, here's one, three, two, four, three, five, and four, six. And for the second case, we have uh, uh, the initial point T1 is fixed and we have, uh, we extend, we just change time T2. Um, again, parameter settings. So this is model settings. Here we define, so we what we will do, we have two experiments. You see one for loop 
and here is the second for loop. Uh, in the first for loop, we will iterate over the uh, disk cases, so we will change different maturity, different settings for the dates for the option, the same for the second case, and we will compare the implant volatilities. Um, first, okay, so we iterate over T pair, which is the, the element of this uh, um, vector, which consists of those uh, uh, vectors, and then we have two entries. We have uh, uh, first entry, second entry, and then we, character we calculate the characteristic function given these two, T1 and T2. So this is only parameters which change T1 and T2. Uh, for the calculation of the characteristic function, this is what we have seen in the slides. So we define tau, which is T2 minus T1, and we have all those lambda expressions. So those are the uh, for the Heston model, so D1, G, C, and A. We have a C bar, delta, kappa bar. Those are the settings that we have also derived in a, in a previous slide for the forward characteristic function. And then we put them together. So you see there is this A plus C bar. Uh, I think here we take an exponent of it. Remember, there was an exponent that we took outside. And then we have the part which comes from the forward characteristic function. So this part comes from the moment generating function uh, for the CIR process, but those those all those ingredients are were given in the in the slides. So this is just implementation of what we have seen in the uh, in the slides. Uh, now, once we have characteristic function, we use this characteristic function in the call option pricing for forward start options. So there is a small adjustment that we have to do because here we, here we have two times T1 and T2. So this also has to be handled in the cost method and the cost method has to operate with this currency function. Uh, you can see there is not too much difference to the cost method, except that we handle this uh, tau, t2, t1. And except for that, we need to only handle this uh, strike. Uh, you remember that in the um, forward, forward, uh, forward options, so forward start options, we had to perform the adjustment for the strike. And this is also handled here in the, in the cost method itself. So you see this signature of the function is different what we have seen before. Uh, you could also do this outside this pricing function, but in this case, I just decided to put it inside and make it separate function for pricing of a, uh, a forward start options. Uh, in practice, maybe you could also keep it just outside and make one code uh, cost pricing for both calls and puts European options and also forward start options. But here I decided just to separate to make it the main piece of code below uh, clearer. So once we do the, the, the pricing, so here we do, do we obtain the options prices forward start options using the cost method. What we have to do, we have to calculate forward implied volatilities and those will cal be calculated with the forward uh, uh, Black-Scholes model. So this is what happens here. So we have market price, we have a strike T1, T2. And then what we do here. So we first calculate the option price uh, for a what I'm doing here, actually, I'm defining, uh, I do a little bit of trick here. So in order to uh, not to deal with a, a problem that we don't know the initial guess for the newton raphson algorithm, what I'm doing here, I'm defining first a grid for volatility sigma. So it's a kind of candidate for the implied volatilities. I do it from zero until 200 with 200 times 200 uh, divisions. Then we have uh, the sigma grid I'm using to calculate all the option prices on that grid. And then I'm, what I'm doing, I'm kind of interpolating on the inverse. So I'm, what I'm doing, I'm interpolating on the market price. Uh, so I'm getting, uh, so if you have a price volatility, you can also look at the interpolation. So if you have a price as an input, you can get what is the initial volatility, what is the volatility which comes from the interpolated volatility. And that is basically the initial point for the newton raphson which is happening here so this part this this trick here it is uh, just a trick to get good initial guess and, and i'm benefiting here that uh, black scholes formula is uh, very fast to evaluate and i'm just defining this grid of different volatilities and i'm interpolating to get proper initial guess uh, i recommend just to look at it and think whether it makes sense uh, but this is personally my my always choice to do it in a efficient manner to get the initial guess. Otherwise, if you didn't find proper initial guess, you have to do some extra coding to handle that. And once we have this initial parameter uh, that normally you, you have to choose by hand, but in this case, I'm just doing this uh, uh, based on the interpolated grid. 
uh, we define the, the target function. So I'm using here a uh, lambda expression for the black shoals, which will be a function of sigma. So I'm changing the sigma. Uh, you see, I'm just calculating the, uh, the distance. So it's uh, not even squared. Uh, the error function is not even squared. I just take the difference between uh, uh, option price from the model and market price. And I'm using uh, a Newton Robson from the, um, this is from the SciPy. So this is SciPy optimize. And then we just uh, used uh, tools, Python library to calculate the Newton Robson applied to get the optimal volatility. So this will be our implied volatility. And keep in mind that this option price, so this Black Scholes uh, price forward start, it is a new option price. This is the price which corresponds to the uh, theorem for the forward option prices. And keep in mind also that the strike here inside and also the style have to be adjusted. So this is sort of key elements to keep in mind once you calculate forward implant volatilities. Okay, so those are the main ingredients. We have the implant volatility part. We have a Heston corrective function for forward start options. And now is the time to um, make some evaluations. So this is the, the results that we will see should correspond to uh, what we have seen in the slides. So let me just look at here. So we have uh, different, uh, this is the different, uh, we have the same distance and we move in time. This is just a changing of level. And this is the second graph when we see we have fixed T1 and we change only T2. In the, when we were looking at the slides, I mentioned that I would expect that because the initial variance and long-term variance parameters are different. This is why I'd expect the term structure, some kind of volatility is moving towards this long-term mean. And let us confirm whether indeed my intuition is right. So we have a V bar here of 10 uh, percent. So I'll make also the initial to be 10 percent. My expectation is that these levels they will basically lever out at the same the same point. So basically, there is no because your initial you see T1 is changing T1, T2, T3. It will move away from T0. It will uh, um, stay at V bar level. Yeah, so V0, it will go to V bar. Let us run the code. Yes, so this is what we see. So indeed, that's confirmed that once we have a long term mean and initial uh, variance to be the same, it's a 10% right here, if you see here and here, then we see that the level of the implied volatilities, forward implied volatilities, is the same. We see some small differences actually in the for the larger strikes, and this has to do to do of course with the, uh, the the other sets of parameters, other parameters which are used in the Heston model. So uh, it is not exactly the same because there is still some time effects that we propagate, right? So we have the volatilities are not fixed at V bar; they will move depending on the other parameters, like for example mean reversion and volatility of volatility. But this is, the, uh, in, let's say, in a majority or a big chunk of uh, uh, explanation for the movements of implied volatilities, I think we are fine. And let's take a look here. Uh, this is what happens here. So, and we have a second graph here. So once we agree with the volatilities, so initial and long term mean, we don't see too much impact on the uh, implied volatilities once we change the, the further maturity. So it's still, it's much more steeper smile for uh, short, um, for short maturities and much flatter and skewed for the longer maturities. But so here we can see that actually this time difference between T1 and T2, it's really relevant in a calculate for the, it has a significant impact once we talk about uh, calculation of implant volatilities once the time changes. But here in this case, once we just traverse in on the time grid, that doesn't have too much impact. Uh, regarding here, I think this is this is this will be it. There will be no more uh, uh, insi uh, insights. Uh, here, maybe one more. We have uh, 500 expansion terms for the cost method, and we have L of 10. Interest rate to zero. There's uh, nothing more to be added. I think. Another model that I would like to discuss in this course is the extension of the Heston model. It's the so-called Bates model, Bates model, which is given here. So as you can see, it is resembles the distribution, uh, the dynamics resembles the one that we already have seen for the Heston model, except that we have additional jumps. And uh, this jump is, as we have seen already in Merton's uh, standard jump diffusion model, it is given by Poisson distribution. 
and we have a magnitude effect uh, driven by the some independent random variable j. Uh, also, because the model is defined under the Q measure, we have some corrections uh, in the in the drift. So it's a compensated Poisson process. We have this additional uh, constant term in the drift. Here, the same as we in the head with the, in the Heston model, we assume correlation between Brownian motions and the rest of the parameters had exactly the same interpretation as we had for the Heston model. Uh, you may ask why we need this kind of extension for the Heston model. What is wrong with the Heston model? The Heston model is supposed to be the superior model to Black Scholes. Why we need additional jumps? And the, the reason for that is that um, empirical studies have shown that uh, calibration of the Heston model, um, it's okay. So model is able to calibrate uh, nicely to a smile and skew for different equity options. However, once we talk about uh, uh, options that will expire, uh, which have very short maturity, so for example, week, two weeks, even month options, and those are uh, also available in the market, then the fit of the Hester model, it is not good enough. There is not enough curvature, there is not enough flexibility in the model to be able to calibrate uh, to those parameters, to those shapes in the market. On the other hand, you would like to have parameters that allow you to calibrate well, not only the short end, but you would like to calibrate to the whole surface. This means that you really need to compensate. You need to choose whether I would like to have a better calibration for the long end. So this means options with longer maturity or options with shorter maturity. And that's not, the model of Heston is not flexible enough to calibrate to both. For that reason, uh, by adding JAP, which is independent of the rest of the processes, we are able to enhance the calibration procedure such that the short end options, so options with very short uh, maturity, they will be better calibrated and that effect will be handled by the jump effects. So this is the, the motivation for the Bates model. Um, because actually also on the other hand, because these jumps are independent and we have a Brownian motions which are correlated, this is independent on anything else, uh, correction and drift is constant, this extension is not so difficult. Actually, I will, in this slide, I will show you, in these slides, I will show you that extension, this, the switch from uh, uh, Heston model to Bytes model, it only requires some additional correction terms in the characteristic function. Except for that, the models are very much alike. Um, okay, let's go further. So maybe the last, last word that interpretation for the parameters, uh, I'm not repeating here because it's exactly the same as we had before. So we have an intensity parameter, xi p, we have a mu j, which determines the, the expectation of j, so it's normally j is normally distributed, and we have a variance for j, sigma j. So uh, we have three additional parameters uh, for the jump part. Uh, it is actually a lot of parameters, right? So normally you would also try to fix maybe some of them to have uh, less flexibility, because if you have too many parameters and all those parameters have the same effect, that would make your hedging uh, much more difficult because this means that every day you need to reposition your uh, portfolio. This is something that we will maybe discuss later in this course. Okay, um, once we do the log transformation, so this is something that we always do, and this is necessary step even for the Heston model to derive the characteristic function. Exactly the same as in Heston model, we need to, we don't have closed form solution uh, for the uh, characteristic function or for the density, we have closed form solution only for a characteristic function that can be used with the cost method to perform the pricing. So after the log transformation, we see that we have, now we have nicer uh, representation of jumps with j times dxp. And here we still have this correction uh, from, the, from the Poisson process. And then we have a half of a variance. So half of the volatility squared. This is something that we also have seen in a Black Scholes uh, case. Uh, also, as mentioned before, this comes from the transition. So once we do the Ito, uh, Ito Tanaka formula, if we do Ito with jumps, basically, we we know that there is a transition uh, that we need to also handle some the drift term depending on the Poisson process that we have here. Okay, uh, PID, I'm not going to uh, through all the steps because we already have seen it for the Mert Mertens model and also for the Hester model. So this is the representations um, that the PID that we have for the Bytes model, you see it's, it's the same as the Heston case, except that we have this additional here constant and we have uh, expectation here, the stochastic 
uh, this expectation that we have to also take care of. Um, model is affine, and this is what I would like to show you in this slide, because the state variables, we have x equals to x and v, so we have a stock, a lock stock in the variance process, and because we have intensity, which is defined only as a constant, does not depend on any state variables. Of course, it will be a little bit too much, right? So if you would have a, a bytes model, and also we have dependence of the uh, intensity, which would depend on additional process, that would be definitely uh, overdoing things, because then we introduce substantial amount of complexity without really... Uh, even exploring what we have currently with three additional parameters. So that three additional parameters is already enough or even more than enough to calibrate. If we make this intensity be stochastic, we will just increase the complexity and very likely we will see very little benefits of that. So it is intensity is still linear in the state variables because it's just constant. Uh, drift, so this is the A that we have seen in this affine jump diffusion framework, A0 and A1. Those are uh, very uh, almost the same, except that we have this additional term for the uh, um, which corresponds to jumps. And again, everything is a fine model. Bytes model is a fine, especially since our jumps and Poisson is independent on anything else. Uh, ODEs. So if we solve the ODEs, uh, details for the derivations for ODEs are included in the book. So I'm not going through the details here, but they are very much alike to the Hessel model. So we have um, ODE for B, ODE for C, and we have a much, a little bit difficult, uh, more difficult ODE for A. A, it is a part which is uh, corresponds to uh, as in the Hessel model. So this part is almost the same as we had in the Hessel model, and we have two additional coefficients corresponding to the jump part. And the boundary condition, the term, the boundary conditions for B and A and uh, and C are the same as we had in a in a Bayes model, in a, sorry in a, in a Hessel model. So we have only uh, I U for B, and then we have a zero for A and zero for C. So this is what is here. Um, so this this term is exactly the same as we had for the Hessel model. This also means that if we have uh, this derivative here, uh, O D with respect to um, for the bytes. We can express it in terms of a for Heston with additional integral over those terms. And this integral, you can see, it is uh, very simple because all those terms are constant in uh, tau, right? Because b is simply i u. So the solution for, for this expression for this uh, term is i u. So there is nothing fancy happening in those terms. And this is what we show here. So this is uh, analytical expression for the expectation, given that our jump j is normally distributed. So we have here log normal distribution. This is the first moment. And we have an iuj. This is also a term that we need to have uh, in this expression, because here b is iu. So we have an expectation of an e j uh, iu. So those are two terms. So this is two, these two expectations. So you see those are just uh, functions of u. Uh, and here it is actually constant. So this is constant. This is function of u. And then uh, ODE for the A of bytes model, we can express it in ODE for the Heston model with these two functions of u. Um, so then the summary of this, it's the, the only difference between, in the only difference in the characteristic function for Heston and for bytes model only is in the A. So A for Bates model, it is equal to Bates, to A of Heston model. And we have those two corrections that they need to be uh, included. And those two correction terms, those include all the information about jumps. So you can see we have a XIP, the intensity. We have a mu j, this is the location of the jump. And we have uncertainty of jump. And except for that, there is nothing else. Uh, in this experiment here, so this is uh, uh, some numerical results. Um, we are not going to discuss the particular impact of all the Heston parameters because those will stay as we have seen it already for the Heston model, uh, but we will just concentrate on a, on a jumps. So we have here uh, the intensity impact on uh, implied volatility. So this is very similar to what we, what we have seen already for the Mertens model the classical jump diffusion model, where we increase the intensity. And then you can see that we have a Morse and also level changing. 
we have a mu j which corresponds to the distribution of j so it's a drift for j how big which direction of jumps on average will be uh, typically in practice mu j will be simply taken as zero that's the, the standard approach and we have uncertainty on jumps so higher the volatility of jumps then we would expect there'll be more curvature because you introduce additional noise that makes it uh, independent noise that will make it more uh, more smile and this is also what in a Heston model what we had once we considered Heston model with zero correlation we could see that there is a smile effect and once we uh, the correlation changes and goes more negative there is more and more skew and this is also what is presented in this graph okay let's take a look at the code what actually changes once we talk about implied volatility for the bytes model um, we only need to have a characteristic function for the base model, which is essentially, uh, you see that all those terms, uh, D1, G, and C are as in the Heston model. And we have uh, also A Heston. So this is exactly the same as we had for the Heston model. And then A, which is for the Bytes model, it is A Heston. And then we have those additional terms, the correction terms. So the link between the Bytes model and the Heston model and that's the whole characteristic function that we have to use. And that's it. So you see, it's, it's a very simple extension and gives us additional flexibility, especially once we talk about the calibration of the model to short maturity options. Uh, in practice, once you talk about the short maturity options, um, it is often considered to be a little bit of a lock because if you have a short maturity options, those expire very, very soon. So I know a lot of people who really lost a lot of money uh, on those kind of bets. However, from a theoretical perspective, once you talk about model, you like to have a model which is able to calibrate to all the market information. And that always gives you a little bit of a, a advantage compared to other models if you are able to calibrate to everything what is available in the market. Okay, um, regarding the simulation, we have again uh, settings for the Heston model and Bates correct so bent jobs so we have bytes parameters for jobs and here we we calculate we iterate over all the parameters so we define grid of parameters so you can see xi pi uh, xi is a p vector so we will change different intensities the rest of the parameters will be the same and we will just first calculate characteristic function use characteristic function in the cost method and then calculate black holes implied volatility and then we will plot it and then we will repeat for the other parameters too so we have a effect of a mu j and also an effect of a sigma j so let me run the code and this is exactly what we have seen in the slides so impact of a xi p on the implied volatilities a mu j implied volatilities and we have a sigma j you can see that this code especially the pricing part it's a, it's very fast right so we have a, just a few milliseconds to get the prices but also to get uh, implied volatilities um, for prices of course this is cost method so it's extremely fast because we could vectorize many things and in particular um, choices regarding the vectorizations and cost methods i have already discussed in this course before so here we will just concentrate on the implied volatility part if you would like to refresh how those implied volatilities are calculated i would recommend just to go back to the previous uh, previous previous lectures uh, the code for this part will be also available online so uh, please feel free to play with it uh, of course it may happen that code code will break at some point so if you start changing some parameters because this is not a production code this is just a prototype to illustrate uh, what is the input what is the output and how to interpret the results in practice you need to co cover all the corner cases especially in, in terms of you talk about calibration and then this code becomes super long and very difficult to read uh, but for the prototyping i think that should be enough once we have learned how to price performance options or forward start options we can use this knowledge to price much more involved or not maybe much more involved but much more interesting derivative so-called variance swap uh, once we talk about swaps essentially means that there is a swap there is an exchange between two counterparties this means you have a, for example two counterparties a and b and one is given one element to the one party and then there is an exchange so for example we have a and b counterparty a pays to b 
a sum, let's say dollars, and counterparty uh, B pays to A euros. That would be considered cross currency swap. Swap means exchange between two counterparties. Um, using our knowledge about forward start options or performance options, we can look into pricing of uh, the, the variance of volatility derivatives. And one of the basic ones is the variance swap. So variance swap derivative is defined as follows. So it has the following payoff. We have a summation. So this element is just a scaling or you can consider it as kind of average. And here we have a summation of all the squared logarithms of performances of an STI divided by STI minus one. So for you have a forgiven grid of uh, dates, we will look at the ratio between two consecutive dates of the stocks. So basically every single day we will monitor the value of stocks and we divide it by each other. So that's a performance. And then we take a logarithm and square it, minus K. Um, this term here, the whole term, we just note as sigma, sigma squared. And this is what we have here by definition. So you see, now we have an exchange of a part, which is corresponds to a variance, and we have a strike, which is a constant. Uh, the question you may ask, why such a strange, complicated formulation for a payoff? Why, why it is like this? Why somebody has chosen this particular summation of logarithm, uh, SIs, STIs divided by ST minus one? It doesn't make too much sense at this point. But hopefully in a few seconds, once we talk about uh, linking of this formula to stochastic differential equations, you will see that there is actually close relation between uh, this expression and volatility of a stochastic differential equation. So essentially, in order to get this, uh, to understand this formula, we actually will need to start from a stochastic differential equation. But here we start from a payoff construction, and then we move backward to what is the relation of this exp expression of a payoff to uh, our stochastic differential equation. Um, we have a swap, so we exchange. You see one counterparty would uh, pay sigma squared, so this whole expression based on historical uh, stock performances, and they would receive, or here depends on who you are, whether it's a payer or a receiver, you'll be paying strike amount. Typically, this amount will be fixed, constant, and given, decided in the beginning of the contract. Once we talk about swaps, it is also very important to note that uh, most of the swaps, actually it's a commonly that swaps are traded at par. So it means that at the moment when two counterparties, counterparty A and B, they agree about future payments, they make this coefficient K or make this strike K such that they initially, once this contract starts, they don't need to pay to each other anything. So here you can imagine that you would choose K such that this value of the whole derivative will be just equal to zero. And then one counterparty will need to pay to other one uh, uh, cash flows over the whole period of the lifetime of the contract. And so once you talk about swaps, typically value of a swap at the moment when two counterparties agree to buy or sell, the value of a contract will be equal to zero. So if you have a strike, the strike will be chosen such that the value is equal to zero. Okay, so let's take a look at the pricing. So we start from the pricing perspective. Again, we have this sigma squared uh, capital T. So this is at the last moment, we look at the performance of the stocks at the whole lifetime. We take X, we discount the payment to today and we take a, a minus strike here under the, the payoff function. Again, filtration is T0. Uh, of course, here we see that we have a const, strike is constant. We can easily remove it outside, take it outside the expectation and only this part will be left. So here you can actually, we can actually say that the whole contract is worth zero at the inception if K is equal to this expectation because k is essentially constant. So if you look at this expression here, k is constant, we can take it outside the expectation with a discount factor. So if k equals to this exp expectation here, then this contract would be worth just zero. And this is what uh, it determines the fair value of this uh, contract. So let's take a look now. Uh, what do we mean by this expression? So we start with this log STI and STI minus one. We would like to link it to a stochastic differential equation. Uh, obviously, if we just take a definition of a logarithm, we have a difference of STIs minus log of STI minus one. And this is if uh, the time interval between TI minus one and TI goes to zero, that will be just simply D log ST. Uh, 
And if we look at squares, that will be exactly the same relation. So we have a D log ST squared. Now, uh, of course, we would like to link the payoff to a particular stochastic differential equation. Otherwise, that would be difficult for us to link what is the uh, meaning behind the payoff description. Uh, here we defined the, the payoff to be driven or the value of a stock to be driven by just uh, black shoals, geometric Brownian motion. So we have under measure Q. So this should be Q here in the following dynamics, which under the log transformation is given as follows. Uh, note that we have a slight extension of the framework because we don't assume sigma to be constant, but to be some time dependent function. So something I already mentioned before, sigma t, which is time dependent, would typically calibrate to add the money implied volatility term structure. This is how you should think about it. So sigma t, if it's, uh, if it's not stochastic, but it's just time dependent, then you have add the money implied volatility term structure. Okay, this is log transformation. Everyone is familiar with that. And then if we just apply our definition uh, of the payoff, we see that using this previous expression for the log sti divided by sti minus one, we will have uh, in the limit integral d log st squared, which by definition is also equal to uh, sigma squared dt, right? So if we look at this term, if we take it squared, we take also this term squared, we will see that via uh, ETA's table, uh, drift terms will be gone. We only end up with uh, sigma squared t, and of course, two times of squared Brownian motion will be dt. So this is what holds here. And we can substitute uh, here uh, in this expression under the integral. So we end up with uh, an integral from t0 to capital T, sigma squared t. So you see, this is a very important equation because it tells us that if we have chosen Black Scholes model with time dependent sigma, we can actually link uh, integral over time dependent volatility times dt here. We can link it to the performance of our uh, derivative, performance of our stock in time. So you see, this is something that uh, this is the missing link that we were looking for, because this means that if you uh, have this derivative, essentially it is equivalent uh, at, with uh, looking at the volatility of the Black Scholes model over time. So this looks very nice, right? So it's a kind of, you could also start from this equation maybe as a payoff defined by sigma squared, and then try to using the assumption about the dynamics of Black Scholes model, you would be also able to arrive at this expression. So first you need to discretize this integral and then substitute d log st squared, of course. But obviously that's nicer. You start from here and you end up with this expression. Uh, we also have this scaling coefficient, right? So it's a 252, that's 252 working days. In finance, typically, we don't use 365 days or 366, but we have 252 days. This tells you about the number of working days uh, in, in, a, in a year. Okay, so now uh, we know that our payoff has slightly changed. So once we know the, uh, the summation of all this logarithm performances squared, it is equivalent with a the integral of uh, volatility. So our payoff is now defined as 1 over t minus t0. So this is this scaling coefficient which comes from the year fraction. So the time distance in a whole year of the working days, sigma squared minus strike. And this is by definition equal to sigma squared vt. Okay, so now we, of course, we would like to find the third value of a, of a contract. So we would have a k we already mentioned that, that k has to be equal to the expected value of this uh, uh, sigma v squared. And by definition, this will be just expectation uh, under risk control measure over 1 over t minus t0. And then we have this integral t0 to t sigma squared t dt. Um, of course, if you have a sigma which is time dependent, that's basically easy. You are just there because you just could determine the sigma t uh, directly. However, if you substitute the stochastic differential equations, so we can actually see that this term, sigma t, it is actually, uh, it corresponds to the stochastic differential equations. So if we take dst divided by st minus d log st, so those are given in a previous slide in terms of stochastic differential equations, if you substitute, you end up with a nice link. So half of sigma squared dt is equal to this term here. 
So what we can do, we can substitute now the sigma square t with this expression, the difference of these two terms. So, okay, if we do this substitution, we will end up with the following expression. So first we substitute the sigma squared with, the, uh, with this difference of two uh, dst over st minus d log st. Uh, we, of course, this is linearity of expectation. So we have two expectations and here we have a ratio of a ds, uh, a dst divided by st minus, and we have a logarithm of st over uh, t0. So let's look at the first part. So here, of course, we have an expectation and this term here, it will be equal to ds t over st is given by r d e plus sigma d w t. So obviously, if we have a, a integral over this term, then we would have a uh, of course, we also have the expectation, so we can easily look first maybe at the expectation inside. So the Brownian motion will be gone, and we have only r times, and then we have a t minus t0, so this is here. On the other hand, we also have integral of a d log st, so simply an integral from t0 to t uh, d log s, uh, slightly different, st is equal to uh, log of s t minus s t is and this is what we we can actually substitute so this is actually what we have here and then we have an expectation of that term so you see if we collect all these terms we uh, we have that the fair value a strike for which this contract would be worth zero is equal to some scaling coefficient corresponding to the uh, period in a in a time uh, from uh, zero to the maturity of the contract we have some element corresponding to the interest rates, and then we have a minus expected value of Q log ST uh, divided by ST0. This is quite interesting expectation because this expectation cannot, if we uh, would like to imply it from the market, we cannot say anything about whether it's a martingale or not because it's not really tradable. We can say that, for example, expected value of a stock with a money savings account is a martingale, but we can never say anything about the logarithm of it because we don't know what is it. However, if we have a, so in this case, in order to price this expectation, so if we like to evaluate this expectation, we will need to perform some kind of Monte Carlo simulation or, uh, um, or use also, if we know analytically the distribution of stock, of course, in a black shoulders case, we know it, so we can simply substitute. And that gives us the, the fair value of the variance swap. Uh, what is another take, nice takeaway is that although we have performed uh, a summation of the logarithms of the performances from all the small intervals, you see that at the end or in the limit, this is e equivalent with a, a ratio or logarithm of the value of a stock at the end divided by the initial value. So even if we have a grid and we do compounding of the performances every day, at the end, what matters? It matters only the, the last value divided by the initial value. So this is kind of uh, interesting. This is something which resembles kind of telescopic sum, but in the context of the stochastic differential equations and stochastic processes. And this is direct application of the pricing of forward start options, uh, so-called performances performance options. Uh, this will be also very important once we talk about uh, Heston model, much more advanced stochastic differential equations for which also we need to first to calibrate the model and then we can use those models to uh, price uh, those variance swaps.